It is good to be with you this morning. What a privilege it is uh, to share God's word with you. So excited to see what the Lord um, will do in our midst this morning. And so let's pray. God, thank you so much for your gift of your son who you sent God to die a sinner's death, the death that we deserved. He lived a life we should have lived and died a death that we deserve, how great is your mercies towards us. Because of that, you have brought us near and we have access to your presence. God, because of that, we can cry, Abba, Father. Because of that, we can go to your throne at any time, God, that you want intimate relationship with us. God, but it came at a high price. And God, this morning, let us not be dull uh, or insensitive to your gospel message just because we've heard it. God, but let that be soaked into our hearts, God, into our minds that it not just be something intellectually we believe, but God, that it would be transformative of our lives, God, that we would taste and see that you are good. God, would you meet us here with your presence and Holy Spirit, when we open up your word, God, you said that you do the illuminating work, God, that we only understand because you give understanding. Would you give understanding this morning? God, open our eyes to see in our ears to hear. Give us a new heart to understand. God, we'll give, be careful to give you the praise, give you the glory. All honor is due your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, uh, like I said, it's so good to be with you all. Um, I'm a teacher. So first thing, we're going we gonna to do a little thing called uh, think, pair, share. Um, so I have a question for you. And what I want you to do first is just think about it uh, for about 30 seconds and then turn to a neighbor. You're going to introduce yourself to your neighbor because you're way too close to each other not to know each other's names. This is the 21st century. Things are going on. We in the pandemic. Y'all too close. Make sure you know the person's name next to you. So here's the question that I want you to think about first. What is something that you need replaced or need new of? Like if you were headed right after here, headed to Target, you got a gift card, you know exactly what you need, something new of. Like, oh, I just need that new thing for the house or I just need, oh, I just need that new pair of shoes. What is something that you need? If you were going to go to the store right now, what would be something that you need something new of? So think about it. Take a moment to process that. Now turn to a neighbor, introduce yourself to the neighbor, and then share, what what is something that you need new of? So, what I guarantee, what I guarantee, what your neighbor said, I wasn't in every conversation, I can't hear that good, I'm not omnipresent, I can't be everywhere, but I guarantee, I guarantee you, I would be really surprised if someone said this, I just need a new attitude, I just need new desires. I just need some new peace. And the reason is because the way I asked the question was something monetary. And I, what I want to talk about this morning is a new that Jesus is offering that money cannot buy. This morning, you, you can go to Target, get your, get your little new uh, shoes, get your new dress, get, get something new for the house. Um, you know, I heard somebody, Caroline, you need a battery replacement, get you a new battery. Um, you can get those things, and you know, with your resources, with your money. But the new that is offering this morning, uh, the title of my message is The Need for New, that there's twofold, that not only is this something that only Jesus offers, but this type of new is um, necessary and required. And and that's the argument that I'm going to lay before you this morning of how Jesus offers us something new. Um, This coming up week, um, we're getting ready to go to summer camp. Anybody come on summer camp? Summer camp is in the house. And so you're like, oh, I'm too old. I can't go to summer. I'm bringing summer camp to you. 
summer camp. So our theme for summer camp is a new thing. And, and I want to talk about the new thing that is required that Jesus offers us this morning. Uh, he, he, through the inspired um, word of God, says in uh, Ezekiel 36, he lays out a promise to the Israelites. Um, they've been going crazy. They're not following God. They're not being faithful to God. Um, they kind of went wayward. And so um, God is going to give them a promise of new. He says in Ezekiel 36, chapter 36, verse 26, he says, And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. It means a, a soft heart, a tender heart to the things of God. In verse 27, and I will put my spirit within you, not just a spirit, but his spirit within you and cause you, make you, give you a new life so that you would walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Verse 28, and you shall dwell in the land that I will give your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God, a promise of intimacy. And verse 29, and I will deliver you from all of your uncleanness, all of your baggage, all of it. And this promise is actually fulfilled in what we call the new covenant, uh, where Jesus says in Luke 22 and 20, he says, this cup, he's referring to the wrath of God going to be poured out on him. This cup that is poured out for you. So even though the cup is being bore on Jesus, it it's our cup to actually bear, but Jesus takes it. He says, uh, this cup poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. That the price of this promise in a covenant is just a legal binding promise. This promise of a new heart, this promise of a new spirit. Jesus says, I have taken the price of that, which is my blood. And so the cost of new has already been paid for. So... Um, I went to Fresno to visit Mama, and Mama's in the house. Hey, Mama Teasley. Um, Mama Teasley's in the house. I went to Fresno to, uh, to visit, and I needed to go to the store. Now, I'll tell you, I regret it, but I end up going to Walmart. You, yeah, you know, you, you, was, you was there too? Um, so in Fresno, yesterday it was 108 degrees. It's hot. It's hot, hot. Hotter than same toenails. Hot. And um, I was wearing flip-flops, and I needed to park kind of in the back because in the front, there's never shaded parking. It's always in the back of parking lots. And so, you know, I park in the back. I get out of my car. I'm wearing flip-flops, and immediately, my flip-flop breaks. The thing that goes in between the toes, it just comes out. And... There's, there's nothing holding the sandal to the bottom, the sole part. And so I basically had to hobble in the store, keeping, clenching my toes and just going like this to get me some new shoes. Now, here's the thing. You would think I would be embarrassed. Walmart ghetto. I felt at home. I felt at home. You know, everybody was like, oh, hey, cause we, we in this together. Just kind of like this. So the reason I share this is because the moment I knew it was broke, the necessity of a new shoe changed my whole outlook. I said I needed to go directly in the store to get this particular piece, and then I can go about my day. Then I can do everything else. The need for new was so high that it reordered the rest of my priorities. And this morning, the need for a new heart, a new spirit is so important. It should rearrange all of your priorities. That the offer of new this morning should be at the top of your priority list before you go and do whatever you need to do about the rest of the day. That's the kind of invitation that is offered to us this morning. I'll kind of make it plain biblically uh, why we are in need of new. So after the people of Israel, Israel were rescued from captivity in Egypt, God set up a covenant 
So this is the old type of covenant, an old promise. He says, I'm going to make a cultural people for me. So the Old Testament or the old covenant was a physical picture of what was to be true spiritually in the new covenant. And so he took a cultural ethnic group for himself, just like he takes a spiritual Israel for himself. And so this is the old covenant. um, And this was also a blood uh, pact or contract with them, where Moses is the mediator between God and the people to usher this in. It was a promise that he would be their God and that they would be his people. And God, being a perfect God, has some standards and some boundaries for the good of their relationship, for the holiness or the set-apartness of his name, and for the good of the people. Now, in Exodus 19, uh, where God is uh, enacting this covenant... uh, He he says to them, uh, he lays this promise out through Moses, and the people respond and tell Moses, Hey, tell God... We ride or die. We with this God. Yes, we'll follow him. He took us out of Egypt. We're there. We're ready. We pledge our allegiance to him. We're right there. Now, mind you, that's Exodus 19, where they make this promise. Uh, in, in Exodus 24, the covenant is confirmed through the sprinkling of blood on the peoples. Like there was, had to be sacrifices of blood so that the covenant could be sealed. It was a legal binding. And, and it said if anybody broke this promise, what was required of them was death. That was why um, there had to be uh, sacrifices there. And, and yet, right after this sealing, God, and he laying out the boundary, specifically tells them, In chapter 20, do not make any other gods out of gold or silver, plain as day. Not even a couple chapters later. What do they do? Exactly that. Well, let's look. Um, We're going to read Exodus 32, 1 through 4. When the people saw that Moses delayed to coming down from the mountain, so God had called Moses up. Uh, to Mount uh, Sinai to actually write uh, on uh, tablet stones, and God uh, did a miracle and actually wrote it. You can read it. It's a powerful thing. Um, but he wanted Moses to bring uh, the, 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 old, um, the Ten Commandments down to the people, and so he brought them up to Mount Sinai. And he was there a little too long. People got a little worried. They're like, we're out here up in the wilderness. This, little, this man brought us up out here. Um, we're a little nervous where he's at, where he at. The people gathered themselves together to Aaron, Moses' brother, who was kind of taking charge while Moses was gone, and said to him, uh, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, here's what we're going to do. Take off your gold rings uh, and uh, the ears, um, the gold of the ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, these are the gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Now, hold up. Wait a second. Pause the phone. Let's take a pause right here. This don't make no sense. A handcrafted piece of golden calf that cannot breathe, cannot move, cannot speak, had just been built and came to existence, somehow reached back into the past and delivered the Israelites out of the land of Egypt. How is that possible? How uh, the uh, idolatry is not rational. It doesn't make any sense. And so you're like, well, I'm not tempted to uh, take my earrings and gold and, and make a calf. And so maybe you're like, hey, Pastor Tyler's been on sabbatical for a while. Is he coming back? Michael, how about you just take our golden uh, rings and make, make us a God to further Mission Church? I don't think anybody's tempted to say that. And if you are, maybe we'll pray for you afterward. Um, but no one here, I don't think, is tempted to say that. But what we do do is we confuse the gifts of God with the person 
of God, just like they did. The gift of God to them, when they're exiting uh, Egypt, he said, I I want you to gather some of the gold and the silver and some of the things for your own as a possession. And it was a gift to them in their exodus. And they turn around and take the gift of God and gave it credit to the God of Israel. They confuse the gifts of God with the person of God. And we definitely do that today. We are so quick to say, it was my business that I built from the ground up that provided for me. I got this job just because I was so educated. It was all of my networking that secured the success of my present. It was a therapist who made me emotionally healthy. It was the man or woman who loved me even though I didn't think I was lovable. It was those gifts of God that we then credit to the power and the person of God. And so in the same way, um, uh, Moses points out, look, look, look here. He gets upset and he basically uh, is going to lay out in Deuteronomy. He says, the reason why you transferred uh, the, the worship of the person of God to the gifts of God is because you don't have a heart in Deuteronomy 29 to understand eyes to see or ears to hear. He's basically pointing out you are messed up from the floor up, busted up from the knee up. You need a whole set of new. And I just love that you need people around you in community to call you out. Uh, My mom is here, so she'll testify to this. Sometimes we'll be at the store uh, together. And uh, it was the other day. Um, And not, not the other day, but a while ago, recently. And we were at the store, and she looks down at my shoes, and she goes, Wow, you really need new shoes. Let's get you some new shoes. You really need new shoes. She called it out, and she was like, this this is not going to work. You need some new shoes, and we bought new shoes. There are people in your lives that need to be able to look at you and say, you need new, and let's bring you so that we can get you new. And so Moses is being that proxy for them to God, and he says, you need a new heart. You need a new mind to see and to hear and to understand how God is good and how God is rightly king in your life. So, And this is where the promise after Moses kind of lays out the reason why they're adulterous to the Lord. He he then says in Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, he says, And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart. Do heart surgery. And the heart of your offspring, so generation after generation, will also need this heart surgery so that you will love the Lord. God, with all of your heart, all of your soul, that you may live. So the connection, you need a new heart. You need an operation on your heart so that you can love God. And that is the meaning of life. That that is why you have been designed, that is why you have been created, is to be in relationship, to glorify, to honor, to magnify, to treasure, to savor Jesus. But you need a new heart to conceptualize that, to know that, not just intellectually, but uh, experientially. So they needed a new heart. Speaking about new shoes, you know, I started running. Again, I took a little pause, and I started running. And I knew I needed some new running shoes because there was some holes in my other ones. And I knew it was time soon enough, put some miles on these shoes. And I knew that I needed some new ones. But then I started to develop um, what is called runner's heel. But even in itself, I'm like, oh, runner's heel. Okay, I'm a runner now. That's, uh, <laughs> when the problem kind of speaks out, I'm a runner. Um, so I, I started to get pain in my heel, and I started to do some research, and they said the number one thing that you need uh, when you start to develop this is you need new shoes. So it was telling me there was pain in my life because I was in need of new. Now, here's the thing. If you look at the shoes, the bottom of the shoes, the sole seems to look fine on the outside. But if you look inside the shoe, you could tell it was losing its ability to support what it was designed to do, which was run. In the same way, on the outside, your soul might look good. You got it all together. You got a new house. You got a, you got a new boo thing. You got a you know, your new car, your, your career set up. If you look on the outside, your soul looks fine. 
But if you were to look on the inside, you would see that the soul's integrity had been compromised and you cannot do what you were designed to do, which was magnify and glorify the name of Jesus unless there is a completely new thing. Your corrupt soul and heart cannot uh, carry the weight of it is of your destiny to honor and worship Jesus. There is a need for new this morning. Here's what I do not mean by the word need. I was recently told that you need to go see Top Gun in the theaters. It was good, but I don't know about need to see it in the theaters. Uh, Some people say, I need my coffee in the morning or I cannot function. No, that's an addiction and we need to get you some help. You should be able... mm. I need a new car. You, you might need a new car, but there's also BART, and uh, there's a public system. Like, if you were out of a car, you're not going to die. You'll be all right. Get, catch some Uber, a carpool with some friends. I need a good night's rest. Yes, you do. Absolutely need a good night's rest. Sleep is very important, but you, if you lose a little bit of sleep, that's, that's one night. That's totally okay. If you don't get a new heart, you will not live. If you don't get a new heart, you are eternally separated from the God of the universe who created you. This need for new is not a strong, uh, com- um, not a strong communication of preference. We talk about need to communicate what we desire and what we really preference and what we really want. No, this is not about desire or want. It's actually, well, it is. You don't want God unless you have a new heart and you need to want God. You need to want Want his presence. And so because of that, there is a need of new in our lives. So just as the people of Israel need a new heart to see and treasure God, so do we. Um, this is what the Bible talks about, uh, needing a new heart. The heart is really important. It says Matthew 22 and 37. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your... Come, y'all know scripture. Above all else, Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your, for everything you do flows from it. And then Jeremiah uh, 17.9 really makes it plain. He's he's, uh, lamenting over the fact that Israel has been so uh, promiscuous with their faith and have left God. And he says, the heart is deceitful above all all things, and desperately sick, without cure, it means in the Hebrew. Who can understand it? That really what needs to happen is you need a heart transplant. You need something new. And really, uh, Mark 7, 21 through 23, and this will be up there. It says, for within, out of the heart of man come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, Murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within and they defile a person. Ultimately, the issue, the heart of the issue is a heart problem. It's not a church issue. It's not a racism issue. It's not a gun issue. It's not a money issue. It's not a sex issue. It's not just an inequality issue or a political issue or a justice issue. It's not a particular sin issue. Those are symptoms and grievous and important to take care of. But the root of the problem, the Bible says, is the heart. The whole heart needs to be thrown away and we need a new one. So you don't need a new boyfriend or a girlfriend. You, you don't need a new friend or a job or a new school or a new place to live. You don't need a new car to drive, a new word spoken over you. You don't need a new sermon, a new season of life. Uh, you don't need a new clothes, a new cat, dog, fish, chicken. What you need is a new heart. The funny thing is you've tried a new job and you're stuck. You've tried a new place to live and you're stuck. You've tried a new boyfriend and you're stuck. You've tried a new girlfriend friend and you're stuck and look where we're at the common denominator is you you go and move to a place you go from job to job you go from relationship to relationship the new thing that you need that the bible is saying is you need a new you you need a new you now here's 
the invitation is not just for those who have not placed their faith in Jesus for a new heart. Because if you have placed your faith in Jesus, the Bible says, Paul says in Corinthians that if you be in Christ, you are a new creation. You are a new creature. The old things have passed away and the new has come. That is true. But this is also an invitation of new for believers. Well, what do you mean, Michael? I've already trusted and I have a new heart, as the Bible says. What do you mean? Well, Paul makes it plain in Colossians chapter 3, uh, verse 9 through 10. It says, he says, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after its creator. So he says, you have put off the old self, past tense, and put on the new self, past tense, which is being, present tense, renewed after the, uh, in the knowledge, after the image of the creator. That yes, you have a new heart, but every day there's an invitation of new because you are being made new. You have been justified and now you are being sanctified. It is a process. And so there's still an invitation of new to the believer. For example, now, you know, I, I was teaching some summer school, and we actually did a, a new model, a co-teaching model, where there's two teachers in the classroom. And I like to banter with students. I'm, I have a sarcastic kind of sense of humor. Um, the teacher I was teaching with, not exactly, not exactly. I was going back and forth with some students, a group of students, and um, they were like, Mr. Cheesley, you know, you ever play a sport? And I was like, yeah, I, I actually, I played some football and some basketball. And then the teacher, my co-teacher, my partner crying, said, uh, you play football? You don't look like you play football. And so exactly that was my response. So me and myself, I immediately responded. I said, well, you don't look smart, but here we are. Um, <laughs> She didn't find that funny. She did not laugh. It was quite silent. And I was so convicted by the, of the Holy Spirit. During break, I had to go up there. I was like, I am so, so, so. She was so gracious. Um, and she was like, well, what I meant by that was you just are so nice and kind that I just don't see you playing a rough sport like that. <laughs> Anyhow, I have placed my faith in Jesus. And... The Bible says I have a new heart that I, I, I treasure and I want to see Jesus rightly. Here's the thing, that even after that, after I've placed my faith in Jesus, what caused me to be really a jerk in that moment was my insecurities that I tried to find value or worth in playing a sport years and years ago. I need a new heart. The Bible says that out of um, the, the heart, the mouth speaks, right? And so I spewed that out sarcastically. I didn't mean harm by it, but what it was, it was unveiling was I was placing my security and my identity in something that could never hold it. I really need, if I was, had my identity was in Christ, that would have never came up. Something so small and something so light, I would have, that would have never happened. I don't know about you, but I need a new heart. This is an everyday invitation to being made new. It's, 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 it's like this. It's like if you had a drowning accident and you had lost some oxygen to your, your brain and they recover you, you're not dead, they, they try to resuscitate you, you're not coming fully back, so you're not really alive. Um, there's not really much mental capacity there. You're in the ICU. You're on a ventilator. They say your lungs have been so damaged, you need a lung transplant. Your, your ability, it was overtaken by the water, chlorine, whatever you want. You need new lungs. You get new lungs. Salvation. New is offered. You have the new organ. Now... The way that sometimes some of us view salvation is, now that I have new lungs and I take in oxygen, just like you need oxygen, you need new. You take in some new oxygen, you're off the ventilator. So take a deep breath. Hold it. You should be good to go. You don't have to breathe for the rest of your life. You have the oxygen you need. You have the new lungs. Boom, there it is. 
no, no, you would die, right? You need to be continually breathing in and breathing out. In the same way, the new offer to the believer is that, yes, you have a new organ of a new heart to understand and know you have the capacity to have intimacy with God, but that does not stop at the moment of salvation, but a new invitation of new is like you need oxygen. You breathe in God's spirit. You spend time with him in the morning, and you exhale sin as you um, confess with your mouth, uh, uh, and he restores you. It's a daily process just as you need oxygen on a daily uh, uh, basis, second by second. So do you need the spirit of God to renew your heart. Yeah. So I, I want to talk about this invitation of new that's on the table this morning by looking at a quick story of the woman at the well. So we're going to be in John chapter 4. John chapter 4, verse 1, says, Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria, called Sychar, and near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A man from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For the disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink from me? A woman of Samaria. Jesus answered her, actually, what you should be really surprised about is if you knew the gift of God and who it was that was saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked for the favor. You would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And the woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? So a little bit uh, of context uh, about uh, the tension or the relationship between the Samaritans and the Jews. It actually dates back a couple hundred years prior to that uh, in the nation of Israel, where God gives them the promised land of Canaan, and they are there, and they, they mess up like usual. They need a new heart. They need a new covenant uh, that is fully um, given to them in Jesus. So... They have some problems relationally, and they actually break up as a nation into a a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. The northern kingdom was really messing up bad. They were really adulterous to the Lord. They were mixing in idol worship. And so uh, the Lord said, okay, I got you. Okay, we're, we're going to take a time out for, for a moment. And they, he allowed the Assyrians to come in uh, and really decimate the northern kingdom. And uh, they came and they took uh, the people that were the strongest, the wisest, the smartest, and left the lowly class of the Jews, the, the people who were were nobodies there. And then foreigners came to invade other foreigners and mixed in with the Jews that were left over, and they made it, and that what birthed the race of the Samaritans. They were a mixed breed of foreigners and uh, the leftover Jews of the northern kingdom. And really what tension arose because the southern kingdom despised the Samaritans because they were always a reminder of the Assyrian attack and they stealing God's promise of the land from them. And so that is the beginning of the tension. And there was tit for tat um, throughout history that leads us up to this point. And so the, my first point in this uh, text that we see here about God's invitation to new to this woman is that new is intentional. That God is intentional with his invitation to new. That he says in verse, uh, verse 4, he says, he had to pass through Samaria. Had to pass in the Greek actually uh, was denoting uh, something that was divinely appointed for salvation. It wasn't by happenstance that God stumbled upon uh, the uh, city of Sychar to meet with this woman. But when he says it had to pass, there was an intention. 
intentionality for this invitation of new. So what you need to know is that Samaria was actually uh, the easiest route to go from Judea to Galilee, but strict Jews would never pass through Samaria because they would never want to be associated with the Samaritans. And so if you were going to be a devout Jew, you would go the long route around. And yet Jesus, despite losing his kudo points, gave up his reputation to talk to his woman so that she could regain a new reputation. And so we have here an invitation of new where God is seeking out this woman despite her circumstance, despite the fact that she was a woman and that men were not supposed to speak to women in public, especially rabbis, we have already the cultural tension between Jews and Samaritans. Uh, And then not uh, only that, but we'll see later in this story that this woman was sleeping around a little bit, that Jesus says to her, bring me your husband. And she goes, I don't have one. He goes, "Uh, you're right. You've actually had five husbands of the man that you're with right now ain't your husband. So um, uh, what you also need to know in this uh, text is that to go, uh, a woman to go to the well was really a social event. They would go together to go to the well to gather water. It was a a thing. They didn't go solo. They went in groups. And we have here this woman go by herself, which is odd. To top that, she goes on an hour of the day that is really hot. You don't go to the well by yourself where it's really hot unless you're trying to hide. So Jesus despite her efforts of trying to hide because of her cultural and social uh, economic status, we have Jesus pushing through and finding her anyway to give her an invitation of new. So I love the game hide and go seek. It's one of my favorite games. As a kid, I loved it. But there was always that one person that I never wanted to play with because it was always so good at finding people. And they would find them so quickly. It's like, how did you win? And they were cheaters. You know those cheaters that we peekaboo in and see where you go to hide? And they're like this. No wonder they're so good. Well, the same way. You do not want to play hide and go seek with God. He will beat you at every time. Let me, I have scripture to show you. (laughs) Proverbs 15, 3 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on evil and good. Hebrews 4, 13, And no creature is hidden from his sight. All are naked and exposed to the eyes of him who we must give an account. Job 28, 24, For he looks to the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. Jeremiah 23, 24, Can a man hide himself in secret places so that he cannot hide him, declares the Lord? Do I not feel heaven and earth, declares the Lord? You do not want to play hide and go seek with Jesus. He will find you even though you are trying to hide. But what the good news, he's not coming to find you to punish you, but to restore you. We can see this throughout scripture that the first people to hide were Adam and Eve because they sinned. And God came to them and said, well, Adam, where are you? And he covers them uh, and he, and he, 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 he reprimands them, but he gives the pronouncement of the gospel message that there is a promised one to come that will restore you to the garden. Uh, When Hagar and Ishmael, uh, Hagar was Sarah's handmaiden, and when God promised Abraham to birth uh, a nation out of him, and though they're really old, uh, Sarah, when she heard this, was like, "Mm, I don't know, we're too old for this, I can't be bearing any children. How about you go sleep with Hagar, my maidservant, and then that's how the nation will, will the promise of God will be fulfilled. And so Abraham sleeps with uh, Hagar. And then there's tension rising because um, she actually got pregnant and conceived. And so there was tension in the household because Sarah was like, it was her idea, but she gets mad at Hagar and Abraham for doing the deed. And um, there's tension and they send Hagar out. Hagar is pregnant. She's out in the middle of the desert. Uh, No status, no water, nothing uh, to... to, um, support herself, and God comes to find her. And she calls and she says, you are the God that sees. So she was found. What about Gideon who was hiding in the wine press from the Midianites? He uh, was hiding because he was so fearful that the Midianites were going to overtake Israel and destroy everything. And God comes to find him and speaks greatness to his life. Thanks be to God that he finds us even when we're hiding and speaks greatness to our life. Or what about when David was disqualified 
vilified by his father when um, Israel was looking for a king and God said to Samuel the prophet, go to Jesse's house and I'm going to anoint a king for Israel. Jesse the father lined up all the sons except David. He left David out in the field and when Samuel said, none of these boys are fit, even though they look good on the outside, God is not looking on the outside, but he looks at the heart. And so uh, he says, none of these are it. How about... Do you have any others? And David was hid in the field. Even though Jesse tried to hide him, God found him to make him king. Or what about David when he killed Uriah and slept with Bathsheba and tried to hide his sin under his uh, own ways through his power? God confronts him through the prophet of Samuel to restore him. And now we know him as the man after God's own heart. Or what about Paul when he was on the road of Damascus heading um, to kill Christians and imprison them. And yet here we are where God finds him and delivers him and becomes from Saul to Paul that God is intentional and coming to find you to offer you new this morning. This invitation of new is so vital. It is so important. Not only that is this invitation of new important uh, and intentional, but the invitation of new is not just something he provides. It is God himself. When he says, I would give you living water, this living water is Jesus himself. He, he, he says uh, his, his spirit. And he goes uh, in John um, uh, chapter uh, 7, he goes, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And now he said this about the Spirit, capital S. Those who believed in him were to receive. So this living water is God's Spirit. That the invitation of new is not just something God provides for you, but it's him himself. That he is the living water. That he is the invitation of new. That intimacy with the God of the universe is the invitation of new this morning to you. And it wasn't until this woman saw Jesus as Messiah that she got to taste new. At first, she saw Jesus as a Jew. Jesus, so kind and so nice as a Jew, upturning, overturning this cultural paradigm of hostility, hostility between Jews and Samaritans, did not do the trick to lead her to repentance or a new life. She was like, oh, so you have uh, this Jacob's well. Are you greater than our father Jacob? She saw him culturally, and she responded with a cultural response. We see then later, she, uh, uh, Jesus uh, says to her about her adultery and her kind of sleeping around in her past. And what does she do? She says, oh, I see you're a prophet. And asks a theological question after that. He says, well, what mountain should we worship on? Should we worship in Jerusalem or should we worship where the Samaritans worship at Mount Gerasim? And he, 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 he breaks this whole paradigm again. And it wasn't until she saw him as Messiah, as we see later in uh, verse 20 through 29, that when she saw him as Messiah, when he made plain that I am the Christ, I'm the one that you've been looking for. It was only then that it says in verse 29, and we're going to go there. 25 through 29, it says, the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, and here's verse 29, come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? She went from hiding because of her past to now proclaiming the same story because Jesus was now Messiah to her, was Savior to her. It was only when she saw Jesus rightly that she began to see deliverance in her life. That she left, it records, the Bible says, she left her pot of water and, was, and left it there and went to proclaim this testimony. It is a symbol of her surrendering her old life and then using the platform from her first story to tell people about the man that said everything that she had done. And what I love about this, what I love is it says everything that I did, past tense. 
Before this, this was her present reality. She was with a man that wasn't her husband. It went from the present to now it's what I did. When you meet Jesus, your life in the present becomes your past. And there's a new, a freshness that is available to you, but you have to see Jesus as, sa- as Savior and Messiah. So here's where I, I want to close. And the keys, you can come up. Thank you so much, Lacey. This new is not just for you. It doesn't just stop at you. But the impact of new reached the whole people group. This story, the woman at the well, or you're like, oh, this is a sweet story. God gave, gave her some living water. Praise God. Hallelujah. Um, no, 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 no. This was a total shift of a paradigm of a people group who had no status, uh, who were despised by the Jews and despised by the other truly Gentiles because the Samaritans were a mixed uh, people group. And so they had tension on every side. And Jesus used the low of the low in the Samaritans to break out new in that community. We see that uh, in this testimony that this woman says, come see a man that told me everything I did. She goes from hiding to proclaiming Jesus's name. And what we see is, it says the town believed in Jesus because of her testimony and went to Jesus. And and this is the amazing part. It says, we enjoyed your testimony. You led us to Jesus, but the reason we want Jesus to say is because we see Jesus for ourselves. The impact of new in your life is not just supposed to stop at you in your cul-de-sac, but you and your family can be changed because you are in the house and are new. That if God makes you new, your whole school could be new. If God makes you new, the whole community could be new. The new is not supposed to stop at you, but it's supposed to spread. You want revival in the Bay Area? Well, it starts with a new year. You. Yeah. The new you is needed. You are needed because of your testimony and your story. Yeah. And what I love about this is that her story and her testimony said, come see a man who told me everything I did. She didn't say, come see me speak at Mission Church. She didn't say, come uh, see about my story. And so the question is, do people leave conversations with you wanting to know more about Jesus or more about you? Do people leave conversations about your testimony, wanting to know more about the story and your glory, or wanting to know about this Jesus who you're talking about, who's supposed to be the bedrock of why you are new? I have a question for you. How many people knew that I was married? Nobody? Nobody know I was married? You didn't know I was married? Why not? Maybe it's because I never talk about her. I never spend time with her. My life doesn't seem like I am married. I'm not. I'm single. I'm I'm single. (laughs) Now you're like, what in the world is going on? I wonder, would people be just as shocked to find out that you're a Christian? You never talk about him. You never are seen spending time with him. And your life's priorities are not rearranged so that you're actually seeing Jesus as king. Would people be just as surprised to find out that you are a believer in Christ, that you go to Mission Church? I pray not. And if that's the case, that is only the exclamation of the gospel to say that we are in need and desperately in need of something new this morning. Let's stand. With every uh, head bowed and eyes closed, if you're under the sound of my voice this morning and the Holy Spirit is, is tugging on your heart. You know that you're in need of something new. You've tried other things. You've tried self-help. You've tried this, that, another. You, you've tried all these new things, but you've never allowed Jesus to make you new. New is in the building this morning. His name is Jesus. That is the offer that's on the table. So if you've never placed your faith in Jesus to have a new heart, to have a new mind, and the Spirit is tugging at you, he's knocking on the door saying, would you let me in? Let me rearrange some things. Let me take some things out. Let me give you my peace, my joy, my satisfaction, my purpose. Let me give you a new heart. If that's resounding with you today, I'm just going to ask that you would raise your hand on the count of three just so that I can pray with you. God already knows and already seeing and is still doing the work, even if you don't lift your hand. But I just want to connect with you and pray with you. 
If that's you this morning, would you raise your hand on the count of three? One, two, three. God sees that hand. God sees that hand. Oh, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, God, that you are the one who brings new. That you didn't ask the woman at the well, hey, go fix your life, then come back and continue the conversation. No, 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 no. The new offer was made even when she didn't have her life together. God, the new invitation is here, and I pray, God, that you would move in our hearts and our minds. And the second invitation this morning is, if you are a believer and you have placed your faith in Jesus, you are made new. Receive that this morning, and you're like, I, I know I have been made new, but I need to be made new again and, I, and again and again. And if you just want prayer this morning, would you just slip up your hand? Yeah, God sees that hand. God sees that hand. God, I, I don't know the struggles of the people that are raising their hand, Lord. The intimate cries of their heart, knowing, God, um, what they are in need of, new of. But, God, you do, and you see, and you care, and you're moving in the mist even now. God, you're the one doing heart surgery. God, would you rearrange some things in their life? Would you encourage them? Would you strengthen them? In Jesus' name, I pray. And we're going to say this prayer together as a local body, that there are people who rose their hand to say, I want to place my faith in Jesus for the first time. And that's something to celebrate. Can we celebrate that this morning? That their life will never, ever be the same. That new has come. And so we're just going to pray a prayer because in uh, Romans chapter 10, it says that if you confess with your mouth, and believe in your heart that Jesus was raised from the dead, you will be saved. And so we're going to do that. We're going to confess with our mouth. And so everybody under the sound of my voice, would you just repeat after me in praying this prayer? God, I know I'm a sinner. And I'm in need of a new heart. God, I want to want you. I need to want you. But I need a new heart. And God, I receive your offer of a new heart. The price has been paid. And I place my faith in you. I believe that you are the son of God. That you died a death that I deserve. Lived a life that I should have lived. And rose with all power three days later. I receive new today, and I will never, ever be the same. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.